Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much. All right. So uh, is that exciting or what, uh, to have Jack here with us and Olivia and a hi to all their family and all of that. Um, just, it's a great, great day. I feel like we should just end now. Like, that's the, that's, that's the best right there. That's, that's, that's what it's all about. But we're going to keep going uh, so that way you get your money's worth. All right. So um, our theme scripture for today is uh, Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let's read that together. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So as we uh, talked about briefly in the, with the children, our, our um, series we're in is called Are We There Yet? And it's about vacations and summertime and, and uh, going, in this case, these three weeks, going swimming, going to the beach, stuff about water. So we, we did three, uh, in this little three-week series, three biblical stories about water. We did Noah and the flood. That's a lot of water. Uh, we did crossing the Red Sea last week. Pastor Bill Steinbauer was here. I loved watching the service online, and he did a great job. So thanks to Pastor Bill for that. Uh, by the way, some of what he said last week was from this book called The Red Sea Rules. It's very thin. It's like a devotional book with uh, 10 devotions in it. A number of our small groups have used this and uh, really found it helpful. So if you'd like to get it, you can get this on Amazon or wherever you get books. It's pretty small, um, but very, very powerful. Ten great insights from the crossing of the Red Sea that uh, Pastor Bill talked about last week. So um, he obviously didn't talk about all ten, but a lot of stuff in there. So I encourage you if you want to uh, get that. So today we got another great story of the sea, Jonah and the great fish. Or Jonah and the whale, as it's sometimes uh, called, although the word literally isn't whale, it's just great fish. Um, it's in modern-day Joppa is where this happens, just south of uh, Tel Aviv, on the outskirts of Tel Aviv. Um, there's a monument there, uh, you can see it on the screen, to this story in Joppa today. I don't know uh, who the guy in the picture is, I have no idea. Um, and I don't think the fish looks like the one in the real story, so I don't know really why I'm showing it to you except that it's the biggest tourist attraction in Joppa, which is why we don't go to Joppa when we go to Israel, because what's the point of it? I don't know. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. So back to the account. So just so you know where we're going today, we're going to be focused on a phrase today. We're going to say over and over and over again. The phrase is, God, do whatever it takes. So listen for that phrase, God, do whatever it takes. So let's get into the story. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to this great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where there was a big monument of a fish, no, where he found a ship bound for that port. And paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So... To understand uh, what's happening here, I tried to think of how do I put this in modern terms, what's going on. It's pretty hard. So you have to kind of use your imaginations a little bit. Jonah is an Israelite. He's a part of the people of Israel. He's part of God's people. And just like today, Israel then was a very, very small nation. Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. You can tell just from the word, it's huge. The Assyrian Empire was perhaps the most cruel empire to ever exist in history, from what we know. They gobbled up towns and villages and cities, and they would torture and annihilate everyone in the city, except for generally the women and children, and they would send them off to slavery, and we can't even really talk about what they did to them because there's kids here. It's bad. They reveled in new ways of inventing torture in the Assyrian Empire. So what happened on Israel on October 7th last year, if you remember that, was nothing compared to what the Assyrians did on a regular basis, in other words. And they were coming for Jonah and his people next. Jonah, as well as every other Israelite, knows that. And so God calls out to Jonah and tells him to go to Nineveh. And I suppose, I guess if you want to put it in modern terms, it's kind of like God calling to a Jew today and saying, go walk through the streets by yourself in Gaza and see what happens. Proclaim the judgment of God while you're at it. Just yell at the people, see what happens. Would you do that? I would not do that. Neither would Jonah. 
So I would do what Jonah did. I would catch the next boat. Instead of walking 550 miles to Nineveh, I'd catch the next boat and go 2,500 miles out to Spain, Tarshish. I would go far and fast. The more Jonah thought about those wicked people, the more frightened he became. He decided to run away from God. That very night, he packed his clothes and hurried to the seaport. That the next morning, he saw a ship that was getting ready to sail far across the sea. Who? Oh, who goes there? Uh, Jonas, sure. Uh, please, Captain, let me come with you. I'll give you all my money for a place on your ship. Huh, looks like trouble to me. Yes, I wonder what he's running away from. Well, I guess we can find a place for you. Jonah boarded the ship and hid deep in the hold, as far away from God as he could. At last, he saw the anchor being drawn up onto the deck. At last, we're heading out to open sea. God will never find me now. She's pretty cute, huh? Anyway. But I love how she tells the story, and I love the last line she says there, which is not in the Bible, but I, I think it's probably what Jonah thought. God will never find me now. <laughs> God will never find me now. Of course, fortunately for Jonah and for us, that's absolutely not true. As King David wrote hundreds of years before, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, <clears throat> if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. So Jonah gets on the ship. And <clears throat> someone, somewhere, must have been praying, God, do whatever it takes to get him back. And in this case, it took a miracle. To be honest, I really don't understand, actually, all that happened. But I suppose that's the point of a miracle is you don't necessarily have to understand it. But a great storm arises, threatens to break apart the ship that they're on, and after doing everything they could to save the ship and to save their own lives, the sailors realize their efforts are futile. They cast lots to see whose fault this storm is, and the lot falls to Jonah. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they ask him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, Jonah replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. <clears throat> and then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. And they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. And at this the men feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. God did whatever it took to bring this sinner back to him. God went to his ex extreme lengths to get Jonah. God's love for Jonah is so evident in this story. God's love for Jonah's mission to the people of Nineveh is so evident in this story. It's so great that God even provided this great storm to get Jonah's attention and finally provided this great fish. And Jonah is entombed there in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. God did all of that to bring this fleeing sinner back to him. There's multiple things for us here, I think. God, do whatever it takes to bring me back to you. God, use the storms of my life to get my attention. Ding, ding, ding. To get me focused on you. God, put me back on your path, no matter what it takes. So Jonah has time. He's in solitary confinement here. He's in administrative segregation. He's got to sit and think and pray. And his prayer ends this way inside the belly of the fish. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. 
but I with shouts of grateful praise will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Thank you, merciful Lord, for delivering me safely to land. Now, Jonah, go to Nineveh and tell those wicked people I am going to destroy them. Yes, Lord, I'm listening. I'm on my way. Jonah entered the city, calling to the people. People of Nineveh, listen to me. The Lord God will destroy you and your city. Stop your wicked ways. What? Did you hear that? You have angered God. He says the Lord is angry with us. Why? What have we done? I didn't realize Jonah had a list, but um, <laughs> I'm guessing he wasn't as cute as that girl, and so he probably needed everything uh, he could get to get through that. But anyway, the people's response to Jonah's preaching was kind of shocking, to say the least. As the scripture says, the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. They were mourning their sins. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let the people and the animals be covered with sackcloth, be in mourning. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so we will not perish. The key phrase for today was, God, do whatever it takes. Can you imagine Jonah walking into a wicked city today doing this? Maybe Gaza City. Or maybe San Francisco. Or maybe Jonah walking into the middle of Washington, D.C. Or maybe Jonah walking to the middle of Lincoln, Nebraska. Perhaps, maybe, the people would come to repentance if Jonah came. Can you imagine the leader of our city taking off her designer clothing and being covered in sackcloth and ashes and sitting in the dust. Would that be shocking? I think it would be. God, do whatever it takes. Maybe we're afraid to pray that prayer, which is maybe why we haven't seen modern cities come to repentance. We pray over and over, I hope, for our nation. I hope we do. And what do we pray when we pray for our nation? I know what I pray when I pray for our nation. I pray, God, save us. I pray, God, have mercy on us. We, uh, we look around at our nation and we see, wow, things are not going well. We fear for our nation, some of us. We fear for our communities. We pray for God's mercy, and, and well, we should. But maybe... The preservation of the American way of life is not what's most important to God. Is that what's uppermost in God's mind? When we pray for the preservation of our way of life here, are we praying for what's on God's heart when we pray that? That's kind of challenging to hear. Maybe God's not interested <clears throat> in preserving America just like he wasn't interested in preserving the Assyrian Empire, headquartered in Nineveh. Maybe God is more interested in repentance. Maybe God would rather hear us pray, God, do whatever it takes to bring our nation to repentance, to bring our people back to you, whatever it takes, even if it's the destruction of our way of life. Are we willing to pray that? God, do whatever it takes, even if it's a great storm, even if it means being thrown overboard into the raging sea, God, do whatever it takes. Is your faith strong enough 
to pray that prayer? Is your trust in God strong enough to entrust yourself to the hands of your loving Heavenly Father? God, do whatever it takes. I, uh, I read a story about a guy who, uh, who actually prayed that prayer, who prayed, God, do whatever it takes. It's a, it's a powerful story. I'm going to share it with you. But it's a story of a guy who uh, loved God and knew that God loved humanity and who trusted God enough to put his own life on the line, just like Jonah did many years before that. You, you might have heard the story before. Matthew 26, Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup of crucifixion be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but God do whatever it takes. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away and prayed a second time. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, do whatever it takes. And then he came back and again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. And so he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. God, do whatever it takes, even if it means crucifixion to save the world. Jesus spoke of himself as the Son of Man, and he said in Matthew 12, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, as God did whatever it took to save Nineveh, to save Jonah, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He compares himself to Jonah there. Read this scripture with me, if you would. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God, do whatever it takes. That was Jesus' prayer as he faced the cross. I don't want this to happen, but God, if this needs to happen to bring these people close to you, I'm willing to do it. Do whatever it takes. As Jesus faced his own personal destruction, as he faced torture, a horrible death, not a death even worse than anything the Assyrians had invented, God, do whatever it takes because Jesus loved Jonah and because Jesus loved the people of Nineveh and because Jesus loves the people of Gaza City and he loves the people of San Francisco and he loves the people in Washington, D.C. and he loves the people in Lincoln, Nebraska. Aren't you grateful we can trust God? That he's proven we can trust him because of what Jesus did for us? That you can, in your prayers, Throw yourself and throw our nation into his arms and trust him to do whatever it takes. That he's already done whatever it takes, namely the crucifixion of Jesus, in order to bring us into a relationship with him. Knowing that he was willing to die for you so that you could live. What a blessing to have a God like that. God, do whatever it takes to bring me back to you. Whatever it takes. God, use the storms of my life to get my attention focused on you. God, put me back on your path, whatever it takes. Let's pray. God, do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes in my life to bring me back to you. Do whatever it takes in the lives of my loved ones to bring them close to you. Even send storms if that's necessary. God, I trust you to measure out those storms in ways that will bring us close to you. For that's the desire of my heart, to be focused on you. God, do whatever it takes to keep me on your path. Amen.